Darkcast Network. Welcome to the Dark Side of Podcasts. Hey everyone, I'm Laura. And I'm Jill. And we are the hosts of Crime Divers Podcast. We are Scottish sisters who tell each other true crime cases that other hasn't heard of. New episodes are released every Tuesday and you can find us on your favourite podcast platform. So what are you waiting for? Grab your wetsuit and join us as we dive into the world of true crime. But remember, watch watch out for those sharks! Hey there, Rainbow Warriors, and welcome to Beyond the Rainbow, True Crimes of the LGBTQ. I'm your host, CJ, and I'd like to now welcome my special guest, criminologist, award-winning true crime author, and as of September of last year, a podcaster. Is that right? September of last year? Did I do Did I get it? uh, Yeah, I get in a lot of trouble because I say, I have an idea. And that's how it started. <laughs> I know all about that. <laughs> Unfortunately, it got me in a lot of trouble when my kid was in school. Well, I would like to welcome Judith A. Yates. Hello, Judith. And thank you so much for joining my Rainbow Warriors and I on this special well, episode am, of Beyond the Rainbow. I said, I am very honored to be here. Thank well, you I am honored to have you. It's special because you're here. <laughs> yeah, you. I I need a little special today, so this makes my day. Thank well, you. Well, you are my special. <laughs> Thank you for being so special. I I was so happy that you reached out to me, and your timing was just like ooh, mwah, chef's kiss. And f- I'm really sorry about the horrid tragedy that shook your Nashville community. Is there any sign of normalcy working its way back into your city? Well, a mass shooting goes through cycles. And right now the city is in healing or recovery mode. They're having candlelight vigils, support signs across the city, of course, the funerals of those lost. And there's that quest by the public to know why. And there's never going to be an answer to the why, no matter what kind of crime it is. Um, So right now they're, they're in that cycle of, finding out answers and and working on healing. Yeah, that was just, that just totally blew my mind. And I hadn't even heard of it until a couple days after it already had happened. It's almost like it's becoming the new normal. Uh, Mass shootings, spree shootings. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that when it happened, I turned to someone and I said, and there will be another in a week or so. And hello, what happened yesterday? Right, in Louisville. Yep, Louisville, Kentucky. There's just so much violence all around. It's kind of crazy, this world. You know, the Covenant Christian school shooting was the 19th school or university shooting in the past three months. Putting the Nashville school shooting aside for just a minute, can you share with us school shooting dynamics as a whole? School shootings and mass shootings kind of go, well, a school shooting is a mass shooting. We just call it a school shooting because of the location. Mm -hmm. And mass shootings will come in patterns. If you notice, Uh, we will hear about one and then a few days or weeks, another occurs. Just like I said, you know, I I turned to someone and I said, there's going to be another. And then we have Louisville. Um, School shooting is often a copycat crime which started with Columbine. Now, there's been school shootings since there's been guns in schools. But Columbine really grabbed everyone by the throat. And, you know, we see these a lot of these school shooters in their notes or their journals or what have you pay some kind of homage to Columbine still. There's no real profile of a school shooter as we used to believe, you know, there are common denominators in all the school shootings I have found, one being mental illness and two, easy access to weapons. Now, that's very easy to say because, honestly, we all have easy access to weapons. 
Hmm. Some of them will write a manifesto. And when I wrote my thesis, I focused on the correlation of bullying, which now it is such a broad term. And my dissertation is going to expand past that. Another common denominator you're going to see in these people is low self-esteem. Right. which is really just the thread that holds all of this fabric together, if you will. Um, one begots the other. Bullying, self-esteem, uh, poor social skills, good social skills. And again, that's, you know, the FBI originally thought that there would be a profile just like they did serial killers. And now there's really not. And there are a lot of fallacies and myths about Columbine that, people took for granted and it spread like wildfire and it simply wasn't true. And I imagine that's going to happen with Nashville because it always does. What I really like is the idea that Nashville PD, Metro PD is really keeping a lid on things. Yeah. You like that. How come? Because it's, it's going to lower the amount of rumor. It's going to keep a lid on what really happened before they get a chance to investigate it completely. And, you know, honestly, we're never going to stop these things. We're never going to stop mass shootings. We're never going to stop school shootings. It's just not going to happen. We're a violent society. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I found is the shooter, be it school or mass shooting, is going to load up on guns and ammo much more than they will ever use because in their mind, it's me against them. So they're going to load up for bear and the plan is always going to be bigger than what actually occurs. From what I understand, the school shooter in Nashville planned to leave the school and go to the mall. Right. And then go somewhere else. Now, you know, honestly, the reality of that, but these people are so far from reality. And we saw this also, I I always go back to Columbine because we use that as a template now. You know, these boys loaded up on guns and bombs and grenades and you name it, uh, homemade bombs, homemade pipe bombs. They were covered in ammo and they had all kinds of guns. They had explosives in their car. Well, that tells us that, you know, when it didn't work that way, like they planned, there is never a plan B for these people. Actually, that's all crime. There's never a plan B. Okay, I'm going to do this and this is going to happen. And then I'm going to do this. Well, when someone throws a wrench in the in the plan, wait, what am I going to do now? Because Klebold and Harris waited outside the school waiting for the uh, cafeteria to blow up. And when it didn't, they looked at each other like, now what? Oh, right. And finally, one of them said, just go, go, go. And that's when they started shooting because. You know, they, they they plan for months and they have this grandiosity that this is what's going to happen and thousands of people will die at my hand. And when it doesn't start, oh, well, now what do I do? Because I so, spent so long planning this. The Columbine shooters, they were intent on blowing the school up and not shooting anybody if they didn't have to? Well, the original plan, they set bombs, homemade bombs in the cafeteria and walked out. Then the plan was when the bombs exploded in the cafeteria, the ceiling would drop. All these people would be murdered. And then those who were running out, they were going to shoot and kill. Then they were going to run to their cars, which they parked in specific areas and either run into the crowd of first responders and blow everybody to smithereens or drive somewhere until they're being chased by a bunch of people and then blow them to smithereens. It was this huge, grand television movie idea Mm. that here's what we're going to do and here's the, you know, the hell we're going to unleash. Woo! Okay. When it didn't happen because they didn't know what they were doing, wiring bombs, um, then it was... Okay, well, I guess we'll go in the school and start shooting. So when they did, at one point, cooling down period, they stopped and they just walked around. And there were plenty of people they could have shot at or shot, and -hmm. they didn't. And then that's when they entered the library. And I really feel like when they entered the library, it was almost like a secondary idea. Oh, wait, here's the library. 
The police response so, time for Columbine wasn't very good, was it? Not compared to Nashville. Well, here's the here's the problem, though. Plans have changed when it comes to mass shooters. Back yeah. then, you have to think, who would have ever thought somebody's going to enter this nice white majority school in the middle of suburbia and start blowing up? Also, they didn't know how many people were in the building with weapons. Everybody's spilling out. Everybody's got a different story. Well, they're in here. It's the trench coat mafia, which was a bullshit lie. Uh, it's two guys. It's one guy. It's 10 guys. They've got bombs. They've got booby traps. They've got grenades. They're, they're, you know, loaded for bear. No, it's just one guy and he's got a handgun. So all of these stories, and you have to look at how many thousands of feet that school was. Yeah, that's true. And it was um, relatively a new concept. Um, I mean, school shooters have been around for a long time, but um, is the biggest, as big of the plan that the Columbine shooters came up with hasn't been around a long time. So we really weren't training our kids, our teachers on what to do if a school shooter entered. Right. And Again, you know, who would have thought this would happen here? Officers are called in and they're going, okay, so what do we do? And when you're a police officer, you don't move until your supervisor gives clearance. Mm -hmm. And that's for your safety and your job Mm -hmm. and all of the above that goes with being a, a law enforcement officer. So I don't like the idea where we start blaming police for not doing their job you know, the same thing is happening in, in my home state where everybody's dogging on the police officers at that school shooting and saying, well, they should have, they should have, they should have. And so, my response is, always, OK, let's see what you would do. They're dogging on the, the officers in Nashville? No, no. In Texas. Oh, oh, in Texas. yeah. OK. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. they should have, you know, well, why didn't they? Well, you know, until you're in that moment. And if you're not trained properly, you don't know what you're going to do. Well, so I think I it's think, wrong that the public is 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 judging that. Yeah, I think um, some of the judgment, though, comes from them not being trained properly. And there you go. And again, you know, I teach a class on um, with my with my first book when it was released. It, the, the crime happened in a very small town. It was the murder of a child. And the perpetrator fit all the red flags of a child molester, of a child, of a person who is going to focus on hurting a child. So when that book was released and it it happily won an award, I notified the city council of that town. And it's quite a small town and said, I will willingly come and teach parents, schools, uh, leaders. The, the red flags of child abuse and um, child predators. And mm-hmm. I was told no, because that was a really bad incident when Brad was killed and we'd rather not, you know, we'd rather just forget it. And anyway, that doesn't happen here. Oh, please. It did that's why the book here. is called, right. That's why the book is called the crime that, you know, doesn't happen here is because everybody was saying, and even when the police arrested the man, they told each other, not Doug. No way. This guy? So, you know, the worst thing we can say is it's never going to happen here. And hopefully it won't. But then you also have to think, too, of the how much money it costs to do training, mm-hmm. how much time it costs to do training. And is that police department, you know, mule shoe police department or, or you know, horse foot police department is not going to have the, the coffers that New York City or Nashville or San Francisco police departments are going to have. So really, it just comes down to the training and, and the prep. And now, like you said, we expect it now almost. Yeah. You know, well, I think and, start, and big. Start, start in the big cities. Start really training them in the big cities and work your way down. Um, I realize that there is a financial problem with training, but it it really does need to be done. I know that's easy to say, sit here and and say that it's easy, but. Right. (laughs) Right. It's like, it's easy to write a a book, you know? Oh, okay. 
<laughs> I it just I I guess the more I listen to true crime and the more I research it, I just get more frustrated. And I understand there's a lot of good cops out there, but it's some of the sketchy ones that really make it the negative light on on police officers. Oh, yeah. Like anything, like anything. Yeah. It's called the 10% rule. 10% of any group is going to be bad. And that's what the news, the media is going to focus on because it's a story. It doesn't make a, a story, story if we say, <clears throat> right, if we say today a police officer did a very good job. He stopped some, you know, uh, DUIs and he stopped by and helped the lady with this and that. And no shooting occurred in, you know, 99 percent of the schools in the United States. That is not news. And the media has got to sell the news. So they're going to focus on the worst of the worst. And that's why I was telling people, you know, don't watch TV. Pick it up here and there, but don't watch the news because it's just going to depress the hell out of you because it's all going to be negative. Yeah, because that's what sells. And it's all about you know money. <laughs> So, you know, the Nashville shooter Aiden was a trans man and, as you said, wrote a manifesto instead of a suicide note. In it, he allegedly said, you mess with our kids, we kill your kids. What's your take on that statement? The manifesto was a suicide note. Okay. And I don't feel like I can make a proper assessment because we only know what law enforcement is allowing us to know as it should be. We talked about that. And of course, the media spin on things. Right. Because if we stand around and wait for something to happen, you know, everybody's going to be staring at a black uh, screen and going, oh, Um, at this time, the manifesto hasn't even been released to the public. But like most mass shootings, it's all turned political. Right. And with this school in particular, it's going to turn religious. Um. On March 29th, Newsweek reported, and I quote this, when asked if police could confirm that the line was in the manifesto, Don Aaron, public affairs director for Nashville Police Department, said no. End quote. Rumors are going to be bouncing around and taken for truth. And it's going to, especially with social media, it's going to grow like wildfire. I could sit here right now and say the manifesto said that, uh, you know, Everybody wearing glasses is ugly and boy, it's going to blow up and pretty soon it's going to be tweeting and it's going to be, you know, why did the mass shooter hate people with glasses? Nobody stops to check the facts. Um, so it's going to turn political. It's going to turn religious with this one and people are going to use it to their advantage. Yeah. Well, plus, even if that line was a statement that Aiden had made, we don't know what came before that. Right. And and I think that tells a lot because uh, I received. okay, so my episode on the Nashville shooting released Monday, yesterday, and I already am getting comments on YouTube. What kind of depraved person says you mess with our kids? We kill your kids. And, uh, you know, like I was saying, we don't know what came before that, even if that was something that Aiden had said. With the climate in Nashville right now and Tennessee in general, people want to believe things Mm -hmm. for many reasons. It affirms how they feel about a certain group. Uh, It affirms their belief in why things happen. And it's going to affirm their their political or religious beliefs. Plus the fact that they're still looking for that answer. Why? Why did this happen? Did it happen? Because, you know, if if I'm uh, what's his name? Phelps, Fred Phelps. I'm going to oh, say, see God. what they do. <laughs> you know? See how sexual. they do. Please. You, you, you turn around and, and there they are, you know, stealing our women and children. And now they're shooting up the schools. But if I'm going to be uh, president of a GLB chapter, I'm going to say, OK, well, this could come from the anger that this this person had over what's going on politically. And if I'm John Q. Public reading the paper and I have no idea about these two sides of the coin, I'm going to say, boy, that was bad. Oh, look, here's a reason. Okay. Hmm. Okay. So, um, did you know that the supposed cover up by the cover, uh, the covenant church of Nashville in 2008 over their pastor, John Perry, who confessed to being a child molester and it fits right in 
with the timeline of when Aiden attended the adjacent school. Do you, and I'm I'm just asking you just your thoughts on it because um, I know you don't have a, a specific answer. None of us will unless they ever release the manifesto. But do you think Aiden possibly was a victim of the pastors and that's in the manifesto? I can't comment on that. And and I don't believe in saying maybe or it could be or they might have because there is enough controversy and it's only going to get bigger. And then in a couple of months, we'll forget about it. But we're dealing with guns, religion, conservatives versus liberals, as they like to label, all things that spark a powder keg. Yeah. Okay, and that's fair. Yeah, I will say this. Tennessee has the most mega churches in the United States. Ooh. And the Department of Justice reports uh, show that hate crime against gender identity in Tennessee has risen in the last four years. These are reported crimes, the only ones that we we know about, or those who couldn't be charged as hate crimes. Um, the state just passed a law that blatantly labels GLBTQ society as a danger to children. Ugh. There is an active GLBT community, but it consists of nightclubs. There are other groups, yes, but you know, when you when you Google it or you look it up for Nashville, Tennessee for GLBT, it's going to show nightclubs. And a CDC study of youth in grades seven through twelve found that LGBTQ youth are more than twice as likely to have attempted suicide as their heterosexual peers, which, by the way, judging by the text to their friend just before the shooting, this was a suicide. This was suicide by cop. Right. You know, shooting the officers in the hopes that they'll be shot and murdered, uh, shot and killed. I'm sorry. Do I think all of this played a part in the shooter's decision making? Absolutely, I do, because we're all affected by our environment. And basically, Tennessee just said, you know, again, GLBT Q are, are negative individuals and need to be stopped. It's basically what they're saying with these laws and these rules. And so here's a kid who's already, you know, filled with questions and confusion and who am I, what am I, and why do people treat me so badly? I really do feel like that made a part in their decision making. Now, what other reasons and could I be wrong? Sure. I just from from what I'm gathering from what I'm picking up from law enforcement. Right. OK. So it's not you know, something that I mentioned in my episode that um, I'm a little fearful of is now what? What about the surviving children of that school? Are they going to grow up to? absolutely hate lgbtq plus community because they're now <laughs> they are witnesses that you know people can do evil and they might associate aiden with the community does that make sense what i just said definitely i did you know back in texas i did a lot of work with dallas p flag parents families friends of lesbians and gays and had my own nonprofit organization teaching diversity and I've volunteered with homeless GLBTQ youth, kids who have literally been picked up, you know, kicked out of their homes for who they were. One of them that you, always sticks with me is on Christmas Day, he came out and his father literally beat the hell out of him and then threw him out on a very heavy snow day. Oh. No money, no clothes other than what he was wearing. I, I think that. Working through PFLAG, I learned that there's what's called the movable middle, because you're going to have the people on this side saying, you know, they're from hell, Leviticus, uh, all these negative connotations. They're going to steal your wife and kids and run off and be lesbians together. And then on the other side of the coin, you have people like PFLAG that said, look, man, educate yourself. And we love our gay kids. We love our GLBT and support our kids and family members. Then you've got the people in the center, which is as always, a very large portion going, well, you know, I don't know. And you you know what you hear if you don't educate yourself. So, you know, we can't, we can control how these children will feel by educating them. And that goes either way. Yeah. You know, that can be the Fred Phelps version of they're all going to hell and everybody hates them and spit on them up to 
you know, look, there these are people just like you and I, and they made a very bad decision and they did very bad things, regardless of who they are. Right. And that, and you know, I hope that that's what parents will teach their kids that this person was mentally ill. Do you believe that Aiden's manifesto will ever be released to the public? And if so, what do you think the repercussions from it could be? Eventually it's going to be released, but we're already having repercussions. One thing I think will be one of the, these repercussions out of all of this is we're going to learn uh, if this can legally be tagged a hate crime. The FBI defines hate crimes as a criminal offense against a person or property motivated in whole or in part by an offender's bias against a race, religion, disability, sexual orientation, ethnicity, gender, or gender identity. And, you know, we have a group that's saying, well, this is a hate crime. This is a hate crime against Christians. Well, hate crimes, you know, occur against everyone, everyone. Now, if the manifesto reads, I will kill these Christians because I hate Christians, then it can be a hate crime. But if it reads, I will kill these Christians since I don't like this school or I went to this school, it cannot be classified as a hate crime. Hate crime statute is very, very specific. We just can't slap a label on a crime because one type of person attacked another. Let's say, you know, you have a gay man walking down the street and he gets jumped and his wallet gets stolen. They catch the dudes and the cop says, why did you do this? And if they say, well, bags are easy to get because they won't fight and they're like girls. Okay. Now we're talking about a hate crime, but if they say, well, he was walking by himself and he looked like he wouldn't fight. That is not a hate crime. And they didn't attack him because he was a gay man. They attacked him because they wanted his wallet. They can't just slap a label on this and say, well, it was a hate crime. And there's people getting angry about that. Well, because we're straight white Christians, uh, you know, they don't want to label it a hate crime. That's not true. A hate crime has to be very, very specific. People snap. And I know you don't like that phrase because you say on your podcast, you say people boil like in a pot. So, okay, people boil all the time, but they don't necessarily go shooting up schools and children. It's been noted in his manifesto, Aiden planned to target a shopping mall and some other places, like you mentioned also earlier. Do you have any clue what might have made Aiden boil over like that? I can't discuss a case that I didn't work uh it's kind of like the John Bonet. People always ask me about the John Bonet and the OJ, and I'm like, I didn't work that case, so I can't say. Mm-hmm. Um, and and like we just said, people don't snap; they boil. More and more and more gets piled on them until someone cannot take it anymore, and they explode. Now, of course, we all don't pick up a gun and, and start shooting from a tower, okay? And that's because sometimes a mass shooting is about suicide by a cop, meaning. I'm going to take out a bunch of people before I go, which I am betting Aiden, this Nashville shooter, I am betting that's what it was. It built and built and built inside this person, festering, probable mental health issues, uh, inspired by other mass shootings. And no, not all of us are going to do something so drastic that we explode because we're all wired differently. And we each have our own way of handling stress and problems. Some of us go, you know, pop open a cold brew. Some of us go outside and walk around. Some of us say bad words and kick. Some of us beat up our spouse. I mean, everybody has a way of dealing with stress and problems. And some people, they unfortunately turn to crime. Charles Whitman, when he shot people from the tower in Austin, Texas, he wrote specifically that he wanted, when he died, because he knew it was suicide by cop, when he died, he wanted his brain studied to find out why he did what he did. So, you know, I, I just hope and wish that this is the incident that will create change. Uh, how this country treats its mentally ill, its minorities. But on the other t- side, I'm a criminologist and I know it won't. I know it will not. It'll be history in months for everyone except surviving victims. It's going to be history in a few months. Something else will pick up or 
people will get tired of hearing it and move on. You don't think because um, the shooter was a trans man that this one will stick around longer because of a lot of hate for the LGBTQ plus community? I'm hoping, cross fingers, it'll educate people. But again, you've got to talk about that movable middle who can be educated. We're never going to get Fred Phelps to march in a, well, he's dead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're never going to get his ill to march in a, in a pride parade, you know, and support the GLBT. On the other hand, we're never going to get GLBT to become a member of his church. So there are people in the middle. Aiden was a member, maybe, maybe forced, but Aiden was a member of the church and grew up Christian far longer than Aiden was ever LGBTQ plus. No, I'm sorry. They'll, they'll never join Fred Phelps's church specifically. Hate churches like that. I, yeah. I can't, even his family, some of them have defected because they don't want to be part of that church. Yeah, it's it's interesting wow. because, again, like I told you, we're talking about religion. We're talking about guns <laughs> to the most touchy subjects in the United States. And, you know, this is a country that discriminates. It discriminates from the beginning. Oh, always oh yeah. Some kind of discrimination somewhere, somehow. Someone is always going to be the bad guy because they have to be because it makes sense in our heads. Uh, and boy, we suck. <laughs> I'm just going to say that we suck. You know, one of the things that I learned because I always get asked, isn't your job sad? Isn't it sad? And you know what? Sometimes I've had nightmares. Uh, I've had to put aside my work because of what it will do to you mentally and emotionally. But I have met some of the best people. I have met parents who some of them wanted to absolutely kill the perpetrator and drag them through the muck. Other parents have embraced the perpetrator and not friends per se, but they have agreed to disagree and move on. Um, I've, I've met victims of crime. I've met law enforcement officers and investigators that are actual true heroes. So I've I've gotten to know such good people in this job. And so I truly believe if you read my book, How to Recognize the Devil, I say this. I truly believe there are angels and devils walking around on Earth and there are more angels. Yeah. And I I say that, you know, I can get very angry at society and, uh, you know, I'm. I'm writing Right now, I'm carrying on a a correspondence with one of the absolute worst child predators I have ever met. He tells me everything. Mm -mm. And if you didn't know this guy, he is so articulate and he's so intelligent. And we have the same sense of humor in a lot of things. He's so well read. That there are times I enjoy corresponding with him simply because I am learning about, you know, we like to think that molesters and and predators are all evil and they're not. They're people and they have evil in them. That's absolutely mental illness to be a child predator. It has to be. You know, I have a I have a good friend, Dr. John White, who he and I were discussing and and he is studying if it is organic or not. Serial killers, that's his specialty. And I, you know, I don't subscribe to one philosophy about what makes crime because crime is part of society, which is part of crime. It's never going to go away. Sometimes I see mental illness. Sometimes I see it as behavioral. He, this fellow that I'm I'm corresponding with, he wants to know why he does what he does. And he makes no bones about it, what he does. However, he also plays victim quite a bit, which is typical. And it's it's interesting to to read his take on things. And and we've talked on the phone a few times. His take on things is so interesting. Like one paragraph, he will be writing me and saying, if I would have only had the help I needed in the beginning, my life is ruined. I'm here until I'm 80 years old. He's 20 something. And then the next paragraph, he'll write about how unfair life is to him, that he wasn't really that bad of a person. He just looked at videos. And then the next, he'll be telling me 
how awful he feels. Because I asked him one time, what what would you tell your victims? What if it was your sister? You know, I ask him very hard questions and he answers them honestly. So there's there's so much to be learned from this. And anyone that has been the victim of crime against a child as a child will tell you 99% of them were not all evil people. They were good people in a lot of ways. Is it because they believe they were good people or do you really feel that they're good people or had some good in them? I think they had some good in them. There's just something inside of them that does wrong. Now I'm not condoning and I'm not saying I personally feel like sexual predators should be locked up for life because they're not going to change. You can castrate, you can chop off arms and legs, you can chop off it, you know, anything that dangles and they're still going to be judgmental. <sighs> I, I don't think I could do that, <laughs> Judith, what you're doing. I have there. an interesting job. Yeah, yeah, you do. And I'm wondering if you might want to tell my listeners where they can find you, like on the socials and a bit about your podcast and what it's called. Okay, well, my po- my new podcast is called Best True Crime. It streams everywhere. And I talk about everything from dark history to the paranormal to historic crimes to modern crimes. I don't focus on the big international, you know, because, again, how many damn books can there be on Ted Bundy or John Wayne Gacy or any of these people? Right. You know? And how many TV shows are going to be made about these people? Absolutely. And this is, I'm so going off topic. So keep me focused because I do that. (laughs) I am so hating that last movie they did about Bundy with Zac Efron because they made him seem like just this good guy who did bad things. And he wasn't. He was a piece of shit because he beat the hell out of his girlfriend. They didn't show that. What I love about your podcast is that you do cover cases I've never heard before. You tell stories that I've never heard, and that totally made me binge it. Well, thank you. Yeah, I I like to talk about the why of the how and the what and what can we learn from this. I don't want to, and and I do the same in my books. The Paul Reed book, for example, uh, When Nashville Bled, I went to every family member who had a known person murdered and said, if you don't want me to do this, I won't. And every one of them said, please do, because I wrote it focusing on the victims that were murdered and how victims are treated and victim survivors are treated in the legal system and the investigative process. Because while Paul Reed was a big news here in Nashville, everybody forgot who Sarah was. It was Sarah Jackson, victim of Paul Dennis Reed. And Sarah's mama was Jenna mother of Sarah Jackson killed by Paul Dennis Reed, they were forever linked to this guy. And being the victim of a crime is just a very, very small part of Sarah's life. She was an awesome softball player. She was funny. She was inquisitive. You know, they weren't angels. She did some stuff, but they were people. And nobody ever asked them, you know, what was Robert's favorite color? Uh, what did this person contribute to society? What did Sarah like to eat for dinner? Tell me about them as children, because I wanted to focus on crime victims. I want every book and every podcast to teach something. I don't want to say a horrible crime occurred. People died. It was gross. The end. Right. Okay. Why did this, you know, what happened here? What could we have done differently? And and that's what I like to do. I like to do investigative stuff. I don't like to do the the gory titillating, you know, he buried her in the basement from the neck down and, you know, dead dogs and slapped her around. And and that's not my style. My style is, okay, why did this person choose this person? What can we learn from this? Because if we don't learn something you know we're just we're entertaining and crime is not entertaining see that's what i enjoy reporting about the who the victim was humanizing them and trying to tell their story the best i can without dwelling too much i don't like covering serial killers i don't like to talk about the killer because they have enough notoriety i think it's important that the victim's get known not necessarily as a victim but they were a person and here's what they were like i think that's important when i wrote the book on uh when nashville bled i talked to robert's sister robert being murdered at mcdonald's and she said will you please get his name right because nobody ever did oh what 
all these years later, and as big as it was, it was the first televised live trial in Nashville and in Tennessee, and they never got Robert's name right. They called him uh, Robert Sewell Jr., and he wasn't a junior. He went by Bert. Oh. And so he'll always be Bert to me. I have a, a awesome picture of him as a kid sitting on a carousel horse. Aww. And it's things like that. And Robert, you know, he was a very quiet guy. Well, he grew up with a bunch of sisters in the house, you know, so and Gabby sisters, too. So that that was, you know, you learn about Robert is he's this very quiet, introspective guy. He had worked different jobs on and off in his he's in his early 20s. He was this individual that was learning who he was when Reed showed up at McDonald's. And, you know, serial killers aren't these fascinating, interesting individuals that should be. They're punks. They're little asshole punks because they pick out the innocent and the and the naive and the insecure and people who can't fight back. If you notice with serial killers, the people that fought back survived, the majority of them. But it's just, uh, I, I just like to do that. I like to teach somebody something about themselves, maybe about a crime, about hopefully prevention. So I'm going to include your website in the show notes and it has oh, your okay. books on it. Cause I went and I took a look at your website and it has um, books you've written. It has, does, uh, I can't remember if it had your podcast mentioned on your website. I know you have games on it. Yeah. I'm going through uh, kind of revamping the website, but it's true crime book.net all one word, true crime book.net. You know, I I go into the darkest periods of people's lives and I ask them questions. And if you as a listener can think for just a minute, the absolute worst thing you've ever been through or the absolute worst thing you've ever done, and it's about to go public, people are about to read about it and learn about it. You know, that's that's pretty brave of someone to be able to sit down and tell me the story. I like to write about, like I said, education, but domestic violence, bullying, victimization. I've wrote books all all on, and a portion of proceeds benefits nonprofits that are made in the victims' names. That's nice. I like that. You know, I've met terrible, terrible people throughout this whole process. I never did talk to Paul Dennis Reed because I knew that he would lie and he'd bring up all kinds of bullshit. And I don't want to hear that. And he died while I was toward the end of the book and I was the first journalist to know about it, my contact called and said, he just died. So right away I start calling surviving victims to tell them because I don't want them to learn about it on TV. They went through enough and there have been crime survivors that they heard about their loved one being murdered on TV or, you know, going back to, to the Reed case, they, they went to her house right after it happened, journalists, and were banging on the Jackson's front door screaming, can we have a picture of Sarah? What happened with Sarah? You know, when they, the family didn't answer because they're obviously in deep grief, they would move to the windows and bang on the windows. And one survivor parent told me that they were followed. A journalist literally followed them everywhere they went. That is some bullshit because that's somebody's life. That right. kid was somebody. So, but weren't they going and, through enough? Exactly. And I had one um, one book set up that I wanted to, I really wanted to tell the story. And the girl who was the the victim said, no. And as much as I really, really, really wanted to write that book, I agreed and, and I'm not going to do it because that's somebody's life put out there and they've moved on. They've become a good person. You know, it, it is interesting. A lot of the victims, well, some of the victims, um, if they survive, they don't want their story told. Exactly. So some of the families exactly. don't want stories told for a victim that didn't survive. I've come across that in my researching as well. Because, you know, you got to think. Okay, let's say your your child, for whatever reason, turns to drugs and they're hooked, which turns into illegal behavior. Let's just grab a number and say prostitution, and there they are out on the street, and they're murdered, and their body is you know, strewn about. You don't want people to know certain things, and that's your child. And especially when people put, I mean, think about Sharon Tate's family. Oh, yeah. You know, they Google Sharon Tate and look at the pictures that pop up. You know, that's their auntie or that's their 
friend or and I just I just think it's wrong. But I hope out of anything with this Nashville shooting, you know, if if you don't agree with someone's life, be they GLBTQ, Muslim, Christian, people who are far right, far left, you don't have to agree with them. But you don't have to be hateful. Thank you. And my my thing is always, look, educate yourself or shut up. You know, <laughs> I mean, you might not agree with the president, but around here we see these flags that say, fuck Biden. That's wrong because, first of all, elderly people are walking by. Children are walking by. Yeah. You know, why display something so hateful? And two, you're dragging people into your muck. So anyway, nonetheless, um, that's kind of the whole, the whole, and it's going to be interesting to see where this this shooting takes us. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us here in my Rainbow Warriors. And uh, like I said, I'm going to put your information in our show notes. Thank you. I, I really appreciate you 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 coming and talking with me today. Well, I appreciate the fact that you're covering all these crimes, especially I noticed one on a Native American woman. And I think that's wonderful because we we tend to ignore certain groups in society, missing, murdered, what have you, unsolved. And uh, thank you for doing that. Oh, absolutely. And I just want to say, love you, Rainbow Warriors. You matter. And remember, it's not a crime to be gay unless you're a murderer. <laughs>